Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Beth Angel. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Work, and I am delighted to welcome you to the 2024 Leon and Josephine Winkleman Memorial Lecture. This year's lecture will take place over a two-day period, and today is part one, um, and um, this is going to be a real feast of two days. Um, I'm really excited about the topics that we'll be talking about. Today, um, and uh, in a moment, um, Dr. Karen Lincoln, who happens to be one of the alumni of our joint program in social work and sociology, so we're really excited to welcome Dr. Lincoln back. Um, today, Dr. Lincoln will discuss brain clearance system alteration and cognitive decline in African Americans with poor sleep quality. And tomorrow, Dr. Jennifer Manley will speak about redefining healthy brain aging. Now, but before we get started, I want to share with you some of this lecture series history. Josephine Winkleman was a 1919 graduate of the University of Michigan Social Work Program, and she worked at the Hull House, a settlement house in Chicago that I'm sure is known to many of you. Her husband, Leon Winkleman, co-founded Winkleman Stores in Detroit with his brother Isidore in 1928. Their son, Stanley, was a leader in civic affairs in Detroit and deeply involved in social justice issues in the city. In 1978, the Leon and Josephine Memorial Lecture was created here at the school through an endowed gift from Stanley and his brothers as a tribute to their parents. The lecture provides a forum for presenting new and emerging knowledge from the social sciences and helping professions in the field of gerontology. The lecture also provides an opportunity to discuss the application of this knowledge to developing social policy, the organization and management of social welfare services and the delivery of social services. We are so grateful to the Winkleman family for their support of this important annual event that informs our profession and provides an opportunity to honor our alumna, Josephine Winkleman and her husband, Leon. And now I would like to introduce Professor Robert Joseph Taylor, who will serve as our moderator today. Robert is the Harold R. Johnson Endowed Professor of Social Work and the Sheila Feld Collegiate Professor of Social Work. Robert is an esteemed and influential researcher who has published extensively on the informal social support networks, which includes family, friends, and church members of adult and elderly Black Americans. He has been a co-principal investigator on several NIMH grants on the correlation of mental health and mental illness among Black Americans. Um, and just this week, we learned that he is he is classified in the top two scientists, top 2% top of scientists from Stanford University's um, uh, database that, that um, tr tracks citation rates among scholars. And so um, uh, Professor Taylor is an eminent scholar um, and that, that's just one more indicator. Now his influence also goes beyond research. His leadership has directly impacted and encouraged a generation of social work scholars. He is the principal investigator of the Michigan Center for Urban African-American Aging Research and the director of the Program for Research on Black Americans. Those two programs host a summer mentoring workshop, which Robert has directed since its inception in 1998. And, in, and just recently, in 2021, Robert received the inaugural James Jackson Outstanding Mentorship Award from the Gerontological Society of America. So with that, I will turn things over um, to Professor Robert Joseph Taylor. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Lincoln. Dr. Lincoln is the director of the Center for Environmental Health Disparities Research at University of California, Irvine. Her research addresses the impact of psychosocial factors such as chronic stress, discrimination, and social support on the mental and physical health of Black Americans. She is the founder and director of Advocates for African American Elders, an outreach, engagement, and health education program that serves individuals 
and their families throughout Southern California. She is an active public scholar and aging advocate. She has op-eds in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and numerous other media outlets. Dr. Lincoln was ranked third among the most influential African-American social work scholars in the United States. And as mentioned also, she was also named among the top 2% of cited scientists, regardless of discipline uh, in the world. Her research, writing, and advocacy are rooted in the Black American experience and across the fields of social work, sociology, and gerontology. Um, she was also a graduate student uh, with us at the Program for Research of Black Americans at the Institute for Social Research. And as mentioned earlier, she's a social worker with a degree from our joint program in social work and sociology here at the University of Michigan. So please welcome Dr. Karen Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to change my view. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be with you today. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. So hopefully you can see that. Well, again, good morning. It's morning, well, actually afternoon in Los Angeles today. And I'm very honored um, to be with you today. Thank you so much for the invitation um, to present and share in the experience of this wonderful lecture series. Um, the title of my presentation is actually the title of the study that I'm gonna be sharing with you today, but it's actually, I'm actually gonna be sharing a little bit more. Um, and so we're just gonna dig right in so I can talk about how I approach uh, my research through community engaged um, principles. And so here are a few learning objectives that to complement the learning objectives that have already been shared with you. And I really hope that um, you will be able to sort of have a better appreciation of the link between sleep and Alzheimer's disease and how that relationship is determined by social determinants and how we really don't know a lot about the relationship between sleep and Alzheimer's disease among African-Americans. And this was really the impetus um, for the study that I'm gonna share with you today. And so just to start off, um, these disparities really helped me decide that this study was one that I wanted um, to delve into. And it had a lot to do with sleep disparities and Alzheimer's disease disparities among African-Americans. And so we know from the literature that African-Americans have a very high risk and prevalence for Alzheimer's disease, two to three times that of whites. And we also know that healthy sleep plays a role in protecting us against cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. But African-Americans tend to have significantly poor indicators of sleep in the United States compared to whites. And so what's interesting and unfortunate is that African-Americans have a high risk for Alzheimer's and a high risk for poor sleep, but these two things have not been examined in the literature. In fact, we really don't understand the mechanisms that link poor sleep to Alzheimer's disease because most of the um, studies have been performed in mouse models and, and not in human studies. So I'm gonna start the first poll. Um, and so what is the recommended hours of sleep for older adults? Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. So for those of you who indicated seven, um, you're actually right. And so here is something that we actually share with our sleep participants and when we're doing, me and my team are doing educational events in communities, we wanna share what is recommended with respect to age. And as you can see in the dark blue, those are the recommended number of hours of sleep for those who are able to sleep during the night. And then the orange indicates not recommended. The lighter blue, um, it can be recommended, but ideally we wanna have at least seven to eight hours of sleep if you're 65 years of age or older. 
And so we talk a lot about the hours of sleep. And so when I'm talking about sleep in the study um, that I'll share with you, and in general, when we're talking about sleep quality, what does that mean? It's not just the number of hours that you sleep. It has a lot to do with you know how often you wake up during the night, how fast you fall asleep, when you go to bed, how many disruptions you have. And if you do wake up during the night, how long does it take you to get back to sleep? And I'm often asked by many of the participants and by many of the residents in our communities, you know, what is good sleep quality? And it varies for everyone. But in general, if you wake up and you feel energized, it's a good indication that you had good sleep. If you wake up and you feel tired, um, it's an indication that you might have some sleep problems. And so the reason why um, sleep is really important, uh, particularly for our cognitive health, is because if we don't sleep enough or if we have poor sleep quality, there are some short-term effects. It affects our mood, our ability to concentrate, and it does tend to impair our memory in the short term, and we just feel tired. It's really harder to function in the short term. In the long term, if we have long-term sleep problem, sleep deprivation over long periods of time, it could impact our work performance and of course lead to cognitive decline. And it also in increases our risk for dementia, which is why it's, it's very concerning that African-Americans in general have poor sleep quality and also um, significant prevalence for dementia, but we just don't know how um, they're related. And so I wanted to share this because it's really important to emphasize that sleep affects our brain, but it also affects almost every system in our body, right? Our heart, our lungs, our metabolism, our immune function, our mood, and our disease resistance. And so sleep is integral, and it's one of the drivers of health disparities. And it's really important that we understand that. So with respect to African-Americans, compared to whites, um, African-Americans tend to sleep fewer hours than whites. Um, to sleep more hours, right? Sleeping too much is act can actually be a, a risk factor um, for dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and other types of health problems. Insomnia, um, the rates are much higher. And then we tend to have more light and less deep sleep, um, which again are risk factors for a host of health problems. Sleep apnea is also very high and tends to be undiagnosed in African Americans. It's undertreated. It's also related to a hypertension, stroke, diabetes, heart disease. And unfortunately, Black men not only are more likely uh, or less likely to be diagnosed, they're also more likely to die from sleep apnea. And there are studies that have shown that about 90% of African-Americans who actually have sleep apnea are not diagnosed. So does poor sleep explain the relationship between Alzheimer's disease um, and other dementias, we, we don't know yet. Um, but again, the study that I'll share with you is trying to get at that question. So before we do that, here's another poll. Do Black Americans' brains age faster than white Americans? Okay. The answer is actually yes. Um, so there have been studies, and this is a fairly new study that examined um, the brains of African-Americans, whites, and Latinos 50 years and older. And what they found was that the brains of African-Americans aged faster, sort of accelerated aging. And so what you'll see on the left, this panel, it's showing some of the regions that were examined in this study using a 3T scanner among uh, 1,500 uh, participants, 500 African-American, 500 Latino, 500 white. In the middle, um, you'll see some white matter hyperintensities. And this is how we can tell the age of the brain, right? So the more of these white matter hyperintensities, the more um, uh, association with accelerated aging and what they show in the sort of colored blue lines um, are these hyperintensities that are associated with vascular problems, diabetes? They're also um, associated with smoking and hypertension. So the more of these that you see, the more at risk you are for some of these chronic health conditions. 
Um, and so for um, these white matter hyperintensities are also associated with small vessel disease, which is associated with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, as well as a host of other chronic health conditions. And this is a 3D model that actually shows sort of what um, we're looking for in some of these scans. And we often see these white matter uh, hyperintensities in midlife. And we, again, start to see signs of vascular burden and other types of vascular diseases among African-Americans at midlife, as well as signs of dementia. And so, yes, the brains of African-Americans tend to age faster. This same study was reported in um, Black media. And the reason why I share this is because when we talk about some of these studies, particularly with the kind of work that I do, it's really important for us to share studies that we see in scientific journals that are also picked up by Black media for African Americans who have some concerns about sleeping and might be interested in participating in some of our studies. And so this um, was a study by uh, Simons et al. that showed that there is premature aging associated with socioeconomic status, neighborhood factors, and discrimination, that are, and they're not accounted for by lifestyle factors. So this shows the social determinants and how they're related to premature aging uh, well above and beyond some of the health behaviors that we tend to promote. So here's our third poll. What percent of Black Americans say they've experienced some form of discrimination or mistreatment in their lives? All right, we're going to end the poll now. So what studies have shown is about 71% of Black Americans say they've experienced some form of racial discrimination or mistreatment in their lives, and almost 50% reported that they felt that their life was actually in danger because of their race. This is a significant source of social stress. This, taint, this same type of stress has been linked to premature aging in African Americans. So there have been studies that have shown that chronic, infla uh, chronic inflammation um, that, that causes premature aging and, and, and organ um, damage has been associated with experiences of racial discrimination. And the reason why this is really important is because it shows this link between the social environment and genetic expression and biological changes in the body that um, can increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease and other types of chronic health conditions. And so just really quickly, because I do a lot of community engaged research, it's important to provide some context for many people to understand what's actually happening in the brain and why sleep is so important. And so one of the examples that I use is the vascular choir, right? So what is the vascular choir? The whole idea is to try to find something that is familiar to people so that you can associate it with the accelerated aging process that happens in the brain. So I start off by talking about complications with diabetes or diabetes in general as being part of the vascular choir, part of the circulatory system. And most people that I talk to understand what diabetes is. And many of the people that I work with in communities actually have a diagnosis of diabetes or, or at risk of diabetes, but certainly can understand um, what diabetes is. And then I can also talk about high blood pressure, which is also part of the vascular choir, part of the vascular system, and has a link to diabetes. And so what's interesting is for some people may not know that diabetes and hypertension or high blood pressure are part of the vascular choir and that they're um, related. So some people who have diabetes don't understand that they might have an increased risk for hypertension. And oftentimes they're not treated as if these diseases are part of the same system. They're treated as separate. So it's really important for us to know that they are actually linked. I also talk about heart disease. And I will say that my father happened to be a member of the vascular choir. He had diabetes and complications. He lost his sight, he lost his limbs. He had high blood pressure. He also had um, congestive heart failure as a result of some of the vascular problems that he experienced. And of course he had several strokes, which is also part 
of the vascular choir, and he had end-stage renal failure. All of these things are related to the vascular system. So of course, if you have one, it increases your risk for others. What's important about this pattern in talking about the vascular choir is now I can talk about the brain clearance system. It follows the kidney because the kidney is the filter. The kidney filters and cleans our blood. The brain also has its own clearance system. So now I can start talking about what is the brain clearance system and why it's so important. So what we've discovered, particularly in mice, um, there've been a couple of human studies that most of the studies have been in mice, that one of the possible mechanisms that links sleep with dementia is the glymphatic system or the brain clearance system. And so what you'll see in this figure is on the right, when we're awake, all those little sort of dark spots, that's the waste that we that collects in our blood. There's a lot of waste that collects, um, not in our blood, in our brain, when we're awake. So when we're awake, our brain is constantly sort of collecting waste, right? And when we're asleep, this is when that glymphatic system is optimal, right? That's when it can clear out all of the waste from our brain that lymphatic system is pretty much disabled when we're awake. So it's not really clearing out that waste, but when we're asleep, particularly deep sleep, that's when that brain clearance um, system is optimal. So if you're not getting good sleep, that clearance system is being altered, right? Which increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. This is an image that I share that shows that spinal fluid sort of circulating through our brain that's sort of getting rid of all of that waste from our brain um, while we're sleeping, which is optimal. The other thing that's really important to share um, in communities is what is an Alzheimer's brain and what is a healthy brain? So it's important for people to see images of what a healthy brain looks like and what an Alzheimer's disease brain looks like, which helps us understand why you know memory is, is starting to fail and why some of our functions are failing when we have a disease like Alzheimer's that's impacting um, the function uh, of our brains. And so now I'm gonna move into a discussion of the brain clearance system alteration and cognitive decline in African-Americans with poor sleep quality. We call it the sleep type study because it's just easier um, to remember. And so the main question that um, we were trying to ask or to, to answer is, does poor sleep quality explain why Black Americans have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias? These are members of the investigative team. I'm the PI on this study. I have co-eyes with um, experience in computational science as well as um, sleep. So both computational scientists and biomedical engineers were part of this study. And here are members of my team. I have students on the right um, and on my left, Dr. Brian Gaines, who's been my project manager for about 13 years. Um, the two top students are at my former institution, USC, and the two students on the bottom are um, my new students at UCI. And here's my team. We always include our seasoned citizens who have been members of Advocates for African-American Elders, which is a health education program that I established about 13 years ago. They've been with me um, from the very beginning and they are involved in data collection, interpretation um, and study design. So two specific aims for this study, just trying to really understand the relationship between sleep and the brain clearance system to see if that will help us better understand how sleep is associated with um, Alzheimer's. So here is our fourth poll. So um, most of our Black Americans are recruited from churches. All right, I'm going to end the poll. So as you can see in the blue box there, um, we have very few churches that are represented. It's not that we don't work with churches, it's that we tend to recruit participants from all other types of sites, um, senior centers, um, apartment communities, social clubs, different 
um, places where African Americans congregate. And I will tell you that it's it's quite interesting that oftentimes when we go out in communities to share education um, materials and information and also recruit, many people tell us that no one's ever come there before. And what we know from the literature, um, we know that participation in clinical trials is really low among African Americans. And we also know that participation in clinical research tends to be low. But we also know that Black Americans are just as likely um, and interested in participating in clinical trials as are whites. One of the biggest barriers is they are not asked. Right? And so when we go out into communities, many people will tell us no one's ever come here. No one's ever come into some of the neighborhoods where we, um, where we go. Um, and people are really interested in participating. So no, we don't typically uh, recruit from churches, but we do partner with some churches. So I wanna share with you how we collected some of the data to understand the relationship between sleep and cognitive impairment. And so it's just starting from the left and working to the right. We use surveys to collect information about sleep, clinical measures, um, about memory, as well as racial discrimination and other types of social factors. We used um, several devices. We used a device called the BioStrap, which is a wearable device that collects sleep data and it uploads it to a phone that we provided to each of the study participants. We also asked participants to include sleep and light meters in their rooms or wherever they slept so we can collect information about ambient noise and light. And this is an image of a 7T scanner, which is one of the most powerful scanners in the United States. Um, at the time we started collecting data, it was the only scanner in the US. Now there are three um, in the United States. And then this image on the bottom is a, a picture of some of the data that we were trying to collect to, under, to really look at that perivascular space, which can really be detected with a strong um, imaging machine. And so here's some quick findings. We found that people who spent more time in bed or slept more actually had um, larger perivascular spaces, right? So it's all of this waste that had not been cleared from the brain um, was actually more prevalent for people who spent more time in bed and slept more. We also found that people who had more of these enlarged spaces with all of this fluid and waste had lower cognitive scores. And we used um, the MMSE, uh, mental, men uh, men mental state, um, exam to get a better sense of, of how those clinical measures were associated with perivascular spaces. And we also found that people who slept more and spent more time in bed had lower scores on cognitive tests. And so here's an um, indirect and direct effects, which shows that more time in bed, it's just pretty much what I showed you before, is related to these larger perivascular spaces and more time in bed is also related to these lower cognitive scores and these enlarged perivascular spaces are related to lower cognitive scores. However, it's really important to look at the mediation effect. What we found was that perivascular spaces completely mediated that relationship. And so what that means is that people who spent more time in bed and slept more had lower cognitive scores because they had more waste in their brain. So sleeping more is not necessarily a risk factor, right? It just happened that sleeping more for this particular sample led to these enlarged perivascular spaces that resulted in um, higher cognitive impairment. So this is a picture of the scanner um, that we used, and this is an image of the um, MRI. This is the actual brain of one of our study participants. And we use these computational methods to identify these perivascular spaces that are very difficult to see with the 3T scanner. And so we're able to enhance the image. It's a um, actually a patented, a very newly patented method to enhance the image and then overlay, which you see those red spots, um, these sort of, um, quantitative images on top of the brain scan so we can actually see the spaces. So it's important to see how many there are and how large they are, right? That both, both of those things are important, volume and number. And that red image on the right, it takes two weeks to generate that image. This is a 3D image of the perivascular spaces. And this is really the only way outside of using mouse models or through you know, brain donations that were able to see these perivascular spaces in living humans. So we talk about the benefits of participating, which is really important. And I wanna make sure I don't run out of time. I wanna take the next couple of minutes. 
Um, so when we talk uh, and to participants about participating in our studies, it's really important for us to share what they're going to get out of it. The other thing that I want to share is when we do informational sessions and share, um, uh, talk about our studies, the, the primary goal is to share information. So whether people decide to participate in a study or not, it's not the ultimate goal. The main goal is to make sure that we're sharing information about brain health and the importance of sleep. So here is our last poll. Which questions were most relevant to the experiences of our study participants? Discrimination, social relationships, or sleep? All right, I'm gonna end the poll. So if you said sleep, you were right. We have found that regardless of the study that we're talking about, um, regardless of what study we're recruiting for, African Americans are very concerned about their sleep. And many times people don't even know that they have poor sleep quality. It's until we start talking about it that people understand and realize that they might not be sleeping well. And through this study, we had a number of people who went and um, were diagnosed with sleep apnea and were on uh, CPAP machines. Because one of the things that we do, and I'll share a sleep report um, with you, is that right after people participate in our studies, when they hand us back the device, we share their sleep report so they know over the five days that we collected data what their sleep looked like. Um, we also, as soon as they come out of the MRI machine, we hand them a CD-ROM that has their scan on it so they can talk to their primary care physician um, about their um, cognitive health as well. So this slide shares some of the tools that we use um, when we're providing health education in communities. And I call them our community health information suite. So we use data walks, we use um, talk show style town halls, game shows and conversation cafes. And I'm gonna share a little bit of that um, uh, now if this is toward the end of the presentation. So this was the first time that we shared the findings um, from the study that I just shared with you called Sleep Tight. And it's very important for me to say that every study that we complete, the first people who see the, uh, hear about the findings are our study participants. So before we share it at a conference or before we share it in a publication, we always share it with our study participants first. So this was an example um, of an event that we held in uh, South uh, Los Angeles where we typically come collect all of our data and where many of our study participants lived to share the findings of our studies. We actually had two studies going on at the same time, this one and one that was focused on racial discrimination and gene expression. And so we shared the findings of both of those studies at this event. This was written up as part of our UCI um, news and media. And here are some pictures from our data walk. So people come in and they're actually walking through the space and learning about um, the study. So you can see them walking in. We provide transportation for anyone who needs it. And that often allows for many people to attend many of our events. And so people are registering in the background, you see some of our students and it is an opportunity for our students to get involved. So this is one of my students, Hawa, who is involved in collecting some of the data and she can share and talk to study participants about our findings. We also have um, community partners who come to share information. So our partners with UCI Mind and, and the Alzheimer's Association and LA Care are sharing health information and some of the benefits um, that people can receive in health education information. UCI Mind provided brains so that people can actually see a healthy brain and a diseased brain to understand how Alzheimer's disease is impacting um, the brain. And here are our, um, our study participants who are listening to me sort of talk about the findings. I'm gonna share two posters with you. Um, so this poster was to show how the sleep device was used to get sleep data. And so on the left, it's, the title is what the bio strap tells us. So people knew what the bio strap was, that's the, the wristband that they wore. And then the sleep report gives us all of these different measures of sleep. And then we were able to share uh, and explain in this poster, what do these sleep data mean? Total sleep time, sleep efficiency, deep sleep, wake after sleep onset. Like what exactly do these sleep quality measures mean? And so we shared this poster 
to share how the data that we collected um, was translated into these um, to these findings. And we also shared um, this poster. So the image that you see that I shared with you and explaining the findings in very simple, easy to understand ways to talk about how sleep impacts cognitive impairment. And we also share infographics, um, sleep tips, because it's really important for people um, to get information and education about how to improve their sleep quality. And here are members of my team, advocates for African-American elders, as well as the students um, and some of our partners that we worked with. And so really quickly, I'm gonna end with talking about um, uh, advocates for African-American elders. Again, it's a health uh, promotion education um, uh, um, program that I started in South Los Angeles about 12, almost 13 years ago. We have now started a chapter in Orange County and we wanted to introduce advocates for African-American elders in OC. So we held a holiday luncheon, our first community event in Orange County. And just to share some information um, with you in terms of the venue, which is really important, we chose the theater. And this is an old theater that many African-Americans knew about, but hadn't attended in many years because it had been sort of a little bit antiquated and it needed a lot of updates, but it had been renovated. And so we were able to bring um, community members to the Yost Theater and host our community event. Here are some of our volunteers who were who basically transformed this theater into a space um, to honor our African-American older adults in Orange County. And this is what it looked like when we were done. Um, we have a stage and this is where we have our talk shows. We give a lot of talk shows and that's one of the ways that we promote health education and brain health education in particular using a talk show format. We provided gift baskets. Each of these items were donated by our community partners and our students um, helped to put um, these gift back baskets together so that every participant 55 and older received a basket. And we had a talk show. Um, we asked um, a homegrown Orange County a physician to be a host to talk about um, nutrition and health and ways to keep our body healthy. And I was there talking about brain health and the host, Tia, she's actually um, a director of a diversity and equity with the Alzheimer's Association and she was our talk show host. Here are some of our um, guests who attended the luncheon to learn about brain health. And of course, we use our game show, Who Wants to Be a Zillionaire, which allows us to um, give away more prizes by allowing people to answer questions that are related to the content that we really want people to understand and remember about brain health. And here are some of our students who also helped to bring this wonderful, beautiful event to Orange County, to Santa Ana. And I'd like to leave you um, with this quote, um, which one of my favorite quotes by Marian Anderson, leadership should be born out of the understanding of the needs of those who would be affected by it. So thank you for, my, for your attention and my email. Um, if you'd like to contact me, is at the bottom of the slide. Thank you. Dr. Lincoln, thank you very much for, for truly an excellent presentation. As you know, I've heard you present several times and I always learn a whole, whole lot. And I truly, truly appreciate it. And I, and I really think that I'm speaking for the uh, for, our, for our audience when I say that. So we have a few questions for you and I will start. So, um, and one is just a comment about... Um, the perceived lack of participation among African Americans in clinical research, and we have the we. Uh, when I say we, I work with a group that uh, has a, it's called Healthier Black Elders out of Detroit. Mm -hmm. That's part of our Michigan Center for Urban African American Aging, and that is our number one finding. That when we ask people why don't they participate, and the the answer is I've never been asked mm -hmm. to participate. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a few questions. So uh, do you know, or is there research on why do African-Americans get less sleep? Yes, there are a number of reasons. Um, some of them are physical, uh, depending on the chronic health conditions um, that one might have and the medications 
um, that people might have, but also uh, some of the drivers are social, right? It has a lot to do with where we live. Um, some of the exposures, whether they're environmental, part of our physical environment, and stress, right? One of the biggest um, factors is, is stress. When you're under stress, it's very hard to relax and fall asleep. And so what we found is that the social determinants are actually the big drivers of sleep disparities among African-Americans. How about um, uh, people who, who do shift work in terms of, you know, uh, nighttime shifts? And are uh, African Americans more likely to do shift work? Yes, and yes. Okay. So, so yes, African Americans are yes more likely to do shift work, and those who do shift work definitely have more disrupted sleep and sleep disturbances um, than those who have sort of normal working hours. And then there's a uh, a question. Uh, so. Um, uh, what is the relationship between, say, lack of sleep or lack of sleep quality and shift, uh, not shift work, and early dementia? So people who may uh, uh, have dementia as starting, say, in their 50s, as an example. So I should say early onset dementia. In relation to shift work? No, I'm sorry. In relationship to uh, sleep, the sleep related to, to early onset of dementia. Yeah. Well, you know, I we can only suppose. Again, we don't have this is one this is the first study on African Americans and there have been very few studies that have actually looked at the mechanisms that help us understand the relationship between sleep and cognitive impairment. And so, uh, what we do know though is that people who have more disrupted sleep, um who have, you know, sleep apnea and sleep problems tend to have a uh, higher risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. And so if it's early onset, it can be linked to a history of poor sleep quality. And so can you share, and here's a, a question from the uh, from our Q&A, uh, and I'll just read it. Can you share a little more information on how you share tips for better sleep quality to the, to the participants in your research studies? So at our, thank you for the question. So at the event that I shared with you at the data walk, we had an, an infographic. And so we put that together, culturally tailored the content so that it was just relevant to, to our experience. And we share that um, at the data walk at the same time that we're sharing findings from the study. And I will also say when during our recruitment, we call them sort of conversation cafes and informational sessions. When we're talking about the study that we're recruiting for, we also share sleep tips at those sessions so that even if people don't want to participate or don't want to enroll, they will have access to information. And can you tell us a little bit more about the um uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm searching the, the, the talk show format and how that works. Yeah, so the talk show um, is just a, a, an engaging way of sharing information. So like this is the webinar um, in a lecture and what we found 13 years ago when we asked residents how they wanted to receive information, they wanted it face to face. And so we had to find a way that was engaging and acceptable to present health information. And sometimes it was complicated information. So we decided on a talk show, you know, who doesn't love a talk show? And so we tend to look for sites that can accommodate us with setting up a real stage. We, we It's a talk show format with a set that has guests and it's, um, it's also scripted, right? So the host is someone who um, has access to scripted information uh, to make sure that we're sort of having a conversation in front of an audience that's relevant to the questions mm -hmm. that many people might ask. And there's Q&A and there's a lot more engagement. And so we're able to share the same information that I shared with you today, yeah. but it's just in a different format that's a little bit more engaging and, and more acceptable. So is the game show format, is that at the talk shows or is that a totally different type of event? They can be separate, but yes, oftentimes we'll have those at the talk show as well, um, because if you're presenting information that you really want people to sort of understand, we use, I usually have eight things 
like takeaways that I want to make sure that people have before they leave the venue. And we put them in the form of a who wants to be a millionaire type of question. And so people have the four options. They can ask a friend, they can ask a guest, um, but everyone is able to get the information again in a much more fun way. And of course they get prizes. So at this last event, we gave away $25 uh, gift cards to people who um, were picked through a raffle to answer the question. Okay. Yeah. And again, this is just for our audience. Uh, feel free to put questions in the, in, in the, um, in the Q and a. So um, here's a, another question. And, and again, we, we have time for several more questions for our, again, for our audience. So here's a question. Um, have you looked at healthcare access uh, slash utilization in your community and whether your participants are able to receive adequate treatment for sleep apnea? So I'll take the first part of that question um, first. Yes, we've looked at healthcare access. And um, what we found is what has generally been reported is that many people have healthcare. Um, it might be different, but particularly with the populations that we're working with, which can be Medicare populations or in, in, we're in California, Medi-Cal um, populations, um, typically people are covered. We don't have too many people who aren't who are uninsured. With respect to um, sleep apnea, that's a harder question. What we have discovered is that many of the study participants and even those who just attend our events, um, have sleep apnea, but were not diagnosed. And the reason that we know that is because they told us is that they were able to recognize the tips, recognize the signs and symptoms of poor sleep quality, and then they consult their physician and they would be diagnosed mm -hmm. with sleep apnea, but we haven't made that um, direct link yeah. other than anecdotal information. Yeah. And do you know anything about the social economic status of, your, of the participants of your research? So we have a balance of um, an, an income. So because we're primarily in South Los Angeles, it's a very wide range. And I, I, I shared the, the map where we did our recruitment and I didn't explain that that's the racial dot map. And so we go to neighborhoods where there are clusterings of African-Americans who are residing in certain neighborhoods. And we also go to neighborhoods where there are fewer African-Americans where there's less mm -hmm. residential and racial segregation to make sure that we have a fairly um, heterogeneous population. And so we have from people who make $10,000 or less to people who make over $100,000, but most of our study participants are um, represented in sort of the lower lower income range. Right. Um, can you clarify if uh, uh, how sleeping uh, too many hours is a risk factor for dementia? Yeah, you know, that's an understudied area. Um, and that's, we're doing those analyses now. Here's what I suspect. Um, there are two things. People tend to sleep longer to make up for the sleep that they've lost because of disrupted sleep. Right. So if you're waking up many times during the night, um, you tend to sleep a little bit longer because you need to make up for those sleep disruptions. The other thing that I believe might be working is that sleeping longer is associated with depression and other kinds of um, diagnoses that we, you know, that are that are related to sort of sleeping longer. And so I, I think that sleeping longer is associated with mood disorders like depression and depression of course is a risk factor for dementia and alzheimer's okay um have you done or do you know any uh studies of people living in rural areas where there may be more health care disparities i don't i don't mm -hmm. know if any i haven't done any studies in rural areas and mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not aware of that literature yeah yeah and uh, getting back to the the uh, uh, the sleep issue and sleeping longer, can you really catch up with sleep? I mean, uh, with uh, Justice Ginsburg, it, it, it was it, it was you know we'd heard about her you know working through the night, especially when she had kids uh, 
and uh, uh, young kids raising them by herself and then sleeping pretty much the whole weekend. Um, again, I guess the question is, can you really catch up on sleep? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you, you answered this already, but just to check a, a little bit of the link between depression and sleep deprivation. Yeah. So, um, if you're unmedicated, um, and you have depression, uh, people who are depressed, who have a mood disorder, it's harder to get up and they tend to sleep more. So there is a link between sleeping too much, um, and depression. And so those are the sort of relationships and they're not positive, right? You're yeah. not catching up on sleep. So definitely if you're sleeping too much, um, it, and, and you're depressed, they sort of go hand in hand. Okay. And how about exercise? Um, how much does exercise play in terms of both sleep and dementia? Well, exercise is important. Um, with respect to sleep, it's, it's actually, it, it, it's anything that helps your physical um, health, helps your brain, mm -hmm. and, and sleeping is, is one of those things as well. I, I will say that um, the time that you exercise has an impact on how well you sleep. And so in general, it's discouraged from, from exercising late at night because of what exercise actually does to your vascular system and into your mood. It's better to exercise, you know, at different hours of the day to improve your sleep. So if you find that you're exercising at night and you're having some sleep disruptions, you might want to think about when to schedule um, your exercise. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, again, here is a question. Um, when looking at social determinants of health, have you found whether like SE, socioeconomic status position or neighborhood status play a role towards influence in sleep? Yes. Okay. Why don't yeah. you, if you can explain that just a little bit more. Sure. So low SES in and of itself you know, may or may not be a risk factor unless it is a proxy for your resources and what you have access to and where you live. We do know with respect to um, some built environment factors and um, uh, social environmental factors, we know that people who live in areas where there's pollution and noise, you know, where the air quality is compromised, where there's sort of more crime, um, those are sort of uh, they're health issues, but they're also related to, to stress. And so we do know that there are some social determinant factors related to, to sleep. So uh, how about this? This is something we haven't talked about yet. Again, it's related, you know, we think it's related to sleep, but how about nutrition and sleep? It's, well, it's related. Um, of course, if you have a healthier ish diet yeah. <laughs> that that helps as well um because it affects your health right and if your health is compromised then your sleep will be compromised and, and vice versa so one of the things that i encourage um people to do is snacking um and when you eat it's not just what you eat it's it's when you eat and if you're eating later at night particularly if it's a, if it's a heavy meal or salty or fat um it can cause um sleep problems because it's just harder to, to digest and your body is actually working really hard when you should be sleeping and alcohol. Um, there are certain things that um, we ingest and consume that can disrupt our sleep. So it's not just what we eat, it's mm -hmm. when we eat. Oh, okay. um, so um, here's a question about recruitment. Uh, what was the most common reasons individuals declined or reluctant to participate? Or, or, or did you have any issues with that? We did not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when we went to a site um, and we had 30 people um, that we were speaking to, we would pretty much get 29, um, if not all 30. So refusal is very low. Um in our experience. Okay. And give me a second here because we have a lot of good questions. Um, so, 
So um, this is a sort of a sort of a tough question, and it's just you know not one that the type of research you do, but an observation. Uh, how well do you think that we're doing as, as for academics in terms of getting mental health research out to the to various communities? Well, I think we can always do better. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it is tailoring um, and the messenger. And so right now, one of the focuses, the foci of um, the work that I'm doing in Orange County is mental health. It's come up as um, a high priority area that has been unaddressed. And so we're working on, you know, communication, um, words to use. I don't typically use mental health or mental illness when I'm doing work in communities. And so I think we can do better with respect to um, the messenger and, and the messaging. And um, when you do your community-based work, uh, um, how long did it take for you to really feel that people trusted you? Because one, one of the issues that we have in research, and it's under, some of it's understandable, is that as academics, sometimes we have a grant that's funded and it goes for five years and then it's not funded. And and then maybe five years later, another grant's funded. And, you know, people in the uh, the community members don't particularly like us coming in and out and not, you know, and would like us to stay in the community. So um, you have any, any any thoughts about that? Well, just in my experience, when I moved to Los Angeles, I started to just get to know people for about four years. Um, and I identified people who had, you know, good reputations and had good connections in communities. Uh, and they ended up helping me to found Advocates for African-American Elders. And so um, my approach was not to ask for anything, was just to get to know people and understand what was important and what the priorities were um, and to make those connections. And then um, I did start to collect data just to get information about um, the communities, what the resources were and what people needed, um, what, what was lacking, what they wanted, um, among other things and health profiles, et cetera. And so it wasn't really until, you know, four or five years later where I started to um, collect data. But by then we had very strong reputation. People knew us and we engage people. So if we don't have active studies, we are constantly engaging our study participants through our greeting cards, through newsletters, through luncheons. You know, we're always staying connected to people in between those um, grant periods. And so we tend to have, we now have, 12-year-old veterans um, mm -hmm. who have been participating in our studies since the very beginning. You know, that's interesting because one thing that we did, and again, these are not our study participants per se. This is part of a, a resource participation pool of people for various studies. And during the pandemic, uh, we started uh, what we call a party line, sort of like the in the past where, you know, everybody's on the phone at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we started that because we were worried about people being, you know, our, our, the members of our community being uh, isolated and lonely. And, um, and that group was set up solely just to have fun and talk about anything they wanted to talk about in a party line type of atmosphere, which is why we sort of called it a party line. Totally volunteer. Mm -hmm. Our goal was just to, again, to keep people active and, you know, to let people know that they're not alone and very easy to be older and isolated. Oh, it's so really I have, um, uh, if, if anybody has one or two more last questions, I, I do have one more. And if we don't get any more questions, we'll end it after this. So uh, wondering, what do you think plays a, a more of a role or could be an additive role? Um and that is um, the socioeconomic position or neighborhood uh, 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 socioeconomic status. Uh, what roles do they play compared to each other? Does one play more? Is it more additive? Can you differentiate the two? Uh, so again, so okay. SES versus a neighborhood, individual versus neighborhood. Yeah, that, that's tricky. Uh, it, it's hard to know because, for example, many African-Americans who um, are considered affluent are living in neighborhoods where the median income is much less than what they make. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so the resources in the neighborhood are more limited than what their money can buy. Um, and so it's very difficult to disentangle, um, you know, which is more important. I think it might depend on, you know, the outcomes that, that we're focused on. But if we're looking at social determinants and what's available in neighborhoods, then I would expect that, you know, neighborhood factors would be important to the extent that those who have more resources can go outside yeah. of the neighborhood. Yeah. So we have, I think we're going to do about three more questions. So uh, one is uh, um, how to support uh, members in, in your own community. Um, uh, any questions? I mean, I'm sorry, any, any thoughts about that? Well, I, I guess it 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 depends on, on what that actually means. And so I can tr just on, in our experience, um, for example, during COVID, mm -hmm. uh, what we did is we partnered with um, an African-American led social service agency um, who were delivering meals. To, to older adults in the neighborhoods. And we were able to add hygiene kits. And we knew from our own experience and from our own connections that there were uh, supplies that people just could not get because they yeah. couldn't get them from the stores. They couldn't go out. And so once we had that information, we were able to get together and, and get donations and you know um, make sure that those items were included when the meals were being delivered. And so one, it's knowing what the needs are. And knowing who to consult in order to get a sense of what those those needs are, so that's kind of how we did it in a sort of a larger scale by partnering um, mm -hmm. with with um, organizations who are also sort of serving um, older adults in neighborhoods. Okay. So these are going to be our last two questions. Um, so talk about disruptive sleep. Um, it, it uh, essentially what is disruptive sleep? Is it that you wake up and then you're up for a while and then you fall back asleep, or is it that you wake up but you fall back asleep, you know, really quickly? Are both of those disruptive, or only one of those disruptive? Well, they're both disruptive, but one will have more of an impact than the other. Mm -hmm. So if you wake up and you fall back to sleep pretty quickly, then you know, it's less of a disruption. Uh -huh. It's more of a disruption if you wake up and it takes you more than 20 minutes to fall back to sleep, then you can, that would be classified as disruptive sleep. Yeah. And if so it- Let me mention frequent, something that's related to that. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I said this, you know, we have two more of this extra. Do you know what role that menopause plays in this for, for Black women in particular? Because Black women have a longer periods of menopause and, 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 uh, and heat sweats. Yes. So menopause is normal. Mm -hmm. um, it can be related to sleep disruptions um, when, in fact, you know, you're when you have the night sweats and your body is sort of dysregulated. But it is not necessarily in and of itself um, a, a sleep problem. In fact, we have to control for menopause when we're doing sleep studies because we know that's a normative event and its effect, it's impacted. Uh, it, it does impact your sleep quality as does medications, but it's it's a normative event um, mm -hmm. and it can lead to sleep disruptions, but not necessarily in the long term. Okay. And then in terms of, this is the, the, the last question, in terms of good sleep, good sleep hygiene, in terms of the study participants, what causes the most problems in, in good sleep? Like Stress. what are the biggest, biggest risk factors for good sleep, I should say? What I hear from almost everyone who has sleep problems is stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no matter what time of the day, it's just that they can't relax enough um, to fall asleep. And if they wake up in the middle of the night, insomnia, yeah. It's hard to go back to sleep because your mind is sort of racing and, and you're stressed. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lincoln, yes. thank you very much for a seriously, for a really good presentation. For a person like me who knows you know, very little about brain health and limited information about sleep, I certainly enjoyed this. I think it was very useful. 
And again, I'd like everybody to please, you know, in the chat, just to let Dr. Lincoln know. <laughs> this will be put up in uh, uh, the School of Social Work uh, YouTube uh, channel. But uh, Dr. Lincoln also has other presentations on YouTube, including if you go to the Program for Research on Black Americans uh, YouTube channel. Again, I'll repeat that a little slower. Program for Research on Black Americans uh, YouTube channel. And look up to Karen Lincoln. You'll see an excellent presentation, both about her research and the influences that she had in early life. Um, and again, just excellent pr uh, presentation. Again, uh, I'm going to end it now uh, for everybody. Thank you very much uh, for a really wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much.